here to help us break down everything that's going on with the virus. NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Nahid Bedalia, an infectious diseases physician, also medical director of the Special Pathogens Unit at Boston Medical Center. Dr. Bedalia, good morning to you. Uh, welcome to the third hour of today. Thanks for having me, Craig. Uh, at his press briefing on Tuesday, President Trump uh, said a couple of things that uh, that we want to dig into here. First of all, he said that the United States has far and away the most robust testing capacity in the world. The president also went on to say uh, that there have been vast improvements in recovery rates across all age groups. Do you agree with those assessments? Well, Craig, I think part of the problem is even though we're doing better on testing than we were and then the first peak, you know, in the Northeast, the trouble is our, as you just mentioned in the spot right before this, our outbreak is outpacing our testing capacity. You know, what we're seeing is that as the outbreak gets bigger, the demand for tests go up, which means that not only are we seeing less testing available, but then the turnaround time in some places is as high as seven days, which doesn't help the individual and doesn't help us curb the cases. And the perfect example of this is, you know, when you look at the test positivity rate, as how many people that we test before one comes back positive. In the U.S., that's about eight. That means we test about 12 or 13 people before we get a positive person. In the U.K., it's less than one. It's 0.5. You know, in France, it's 1.5, which means we're not keeping abreast with that. The other problem is the mortality has increased. But, Craig, yesterday, almost 1,200 Americans died of this disease before the end of this year. It's thought that coronavirus might be the third leading cause of death. So even though there have been improvements, the, the deaths may actually go up again because hospitalizations are getting overwhelmed. 54,000 people are hospitalized. And what we know from other outbreaks is if health systems get overwhelmed, the mortality rate starts going up again. And, and we've also seen an increase in children testing positive. I mean, what, what advances do you think we need to start seeing infection rates and hospitalizations continue to lessen across the board? Well, that's right. And, and the test positivity rate in children that you mentioned in May was 3.7 percent. And at the end of July, it was 8.4. And it's unclear if it's, you know, it's because we're testing children more or that children are more exposed because, you know, we were so locked down in May, they didn't have the chance to potentially get exposed. The, the kind of, you know, the, the for schools to open, for, you know, for us to take any of these other steps that may actually increase not just community transmission, but potentially transmission in kids, we need to accomplish two things. We need to bring down the community prevalence of this disease. You know, uh, what happens in schools looks like is going to be a reflection of what's happening in communities. It's decreasing that disease transmission. But then the other part is even in places where the disease transmission is low, we learn from the example of Israel when they had low numbers and they opened schools, they still had transmissions. The trouble is we still need to make sure our schools have the resources that they need. A National Academy of Medicine report said that an average school districts of 3,300 students will need about one Point eight million dollars to make sure that they have personal protective equipment, you know, ability to change their airflow, make sure the teachers and students have personal protective equipment. We need to do the hard work if we want to, kids to basically be able to attend school. Researchers, as you know, on Monday, they released some findings from this study out of China that, that looked at brain MRIs of folks who've survived the coronavirus. And they found that there may be lasting effects months after recovery. There was also a study out of Germany that said that there may be cardiovascular effects. Uh, even the CDC finding that a fifth of healthy young people continue to have prolonged uh, symptoms. How real is the possibility, Dr. Bedelia, that if you've had coronavirus, you're going to probably have some sort of lasting effect uh, for a long time, even after the virus is no longer in your system? Well, Craig, the evidence is mounting. Um, you know, we have multiple reports, and aside from the studies that you mentioned, there was a study out of Italy that said that for people who are hospitalized, 87 percent of the people reported at least one symptom two months out. Um, you know, and, and so the, this is an emerging virus. And in my own experience with other emerging viruses is that, unfortunately, we learn the full scope of the disease these viruses cause and the impact they have on human body as we live through it. And then we don't have as much experience with this virus. And so what we need, you know, is, is to be able to get longer term follow up studies of coronavirus survivors to get a sense of the impact of this. But there does seem to be a signal to say that even in healthy people, a portion of people that survive may have some amount of disability or a burden of disease, you know, leaving that acute phase of disease. What proportion of patients have that? We don't know. And we don't know who's actually at risk for getting it. Let's end on some promising news here. The president uh, also shared that two vaccine candidates are in the final 
stage of clinical trials. How optimistic should we be that a vaccine is, is, is going to uh, present itself sooner rather than later? We have made immense, you know, um, immense sort of strides in getting multiple vaccine um, you know, candidates into phase three trials. The clinical trials will help us, you know, determine if they're actually effective. The the the, the longest trials, though, unfortunately, are these phase three trials. And and after they we get a signal of of effectiveness, which numbers from the earlier trials say we might. The problem is going to be determining how effective are they? If they're fifty percent effective, you know, like what does that mean in terms of our, our being able to achieve a herd immunity from vaccine? It means a lot more people would have to take the vaccine. The other thing is how long does that immunity last from from the vaccine itself? You know, we have vaccines for a lot of other diseases, measles, yellow fever, and we, we still get outbreaks. And a huge part of this is making sure that um, people, you know, take the vaccine um, and that we follow up to make sure um, in these studies, that not only is it effective, but it continues to show safety in a larger group of people. Yeah, as uh, I think Dr. Zhao pointed out last week, it's, it's not uh, the vaccines that save lives. It's the vaccinations uh, that save lives. Dr. Bedelia, thank you. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Do appreciate you.